response, and this will be shown by Dr. David Waller. He's a well-known European thoracic surgeon at Glenfield Hospital in Leicester in the UK. And the title of his presentation is that increased investment in thoracic surgical expertise increased the UK lung cancer resection rate. Paul, thanks very much. So my, my name is David Waller. I'm a consultant thoracic surgeon, a pure thoracic surgeon. I work in the Glenfield Hospital in Leicester in the United Kingdom. And I'd like to summarise the results of a presentation just made by my senior registrar, Kelvin Lau, at the presidential session. I want to describe to you the effects we found of investing in thoracic surgery on lung cancer resection rates. The background is that in the UK, lung cancer <coughs> has been undertreated. There is evidence that in comparison to other Western and developed countries, our treatment rates and survival for lung cancer fall way below the accepted standards. This has been focused on by the British media and hopefully some uh, changes have been made as a result. Within our country of around 60 million people, there is a wide variation in the access to lung cancer surgery. As you can see from this map, there are areas of the country which have a six-fold greater resection rate. Just to put that into perspective, if you are an elderly patient with lung cancer in Cornwall, you are six times less likely to get lung cancer surgery than if you live in Leicester. And clearly this is of major concern both to the patients but also to the politicians. As you can see here, this again has att attracted the attention of the British media in the past. This graph shows the resection rate adjusted for various confounding factors such as sex and age. This is a real difference. The background to this is the standard UK lung cancer pathway. Because of our state healthcare system, virtually all cases of lung cancer are referred in from primary care to a specialist lung cancer service. They are initially screened by a chest physician and then discussed at a multidisciplinary team which will include a chest physician, an oncologist and hopefully in most cases a surgeon. But this is the first point where the surgeon is involved in the lung cancer pathway and unfortunately it is the case in the United Kingdom that not all cases of lung cancer are discussed in the presence of a surgeon at the MDT. The decision uh, is made by the MDT then to refer the case on to the surgeon. And as I'll show you, in the United Kingdom, if you have lung cancer, you may or may not see a surgeon who has a specialist interest in that disease. One of the benefits of this, well, one of the aspects of this presentation has shown the benefit of the National Lung Cancer Audit, which is a way of recording all the data pertaining to lung cancer patients within our state healthcare system. And our presentation is based on the analysis of its results. Within our national healthcare system, I'm focusing now on England, there are 33 cancer networks comprising 174 hospital trusts. 18% of these trusts have thoracic surgical centres. But in 58% of these trusts, there are less than two pure thoracic surgeons. In 2008, which is the last analysed uh, lung cancer audit, over 15,000 confirmed cases of lung cancer were in the United Kingdom, and 14% underwent resection. Data from the Centre for Workforce Intelligence, uh, current data, in England, uh, shows this distribution. Less than half of the surgeons operating on lung cancer are pure thoracic surgeons. There are 63 surgeons whose practice combines both cardiac surgery and lung surgery. And there are 114 surgeons whose uh, surgery comprises entirely heart surgery. Our analysis in this presentation related the data from the National Lung Cancer Audit to manpower data obtained uh, from that last source. And these are the main findings. Lung cancer resection rates are higher in centres who treat more cases. 
lung cancer resection rates are higher in patients who are first seen in one of the specialist centers, the base centers where there is thoracic surgery, rather than in the referring centers. Importantly, lung cancer resection rates are higher in centers where there are two or more specialist thoracic surgeons as opposed to cardiothoracic surgeons. And reflecting the lung cancer pathway, lung cancer resection rates are higher, significantly higher, when surgeons attend preoperative MDTs. And we found that uh, after the analysis of the 2008 data, there were appointments in five of those 31 units of new specialist thoracic surgeons. When we reanalyzed the changes in resection rates, surprise, surprise, the increase in resection rate was greatest in those units who had employed new specialist thoracic surgeons. What, did this, what does this uh, analysis mean? If we look at the implications for the lung cancer surgery workforce, and we take the network that had the best resection rate in that data, they had three pure thoracic surgeons who saw 450 new cases of lung cancer per year in their MDTs. And each surgeon attended, on average, 1.5 MDTs a week. So, if we use that as the gold standard, and we applied that across uh, England, for 15,700 cases, we would need 107 thoracic surgeons. And if we looked at the MDT attendance, if we kept the same number of MDTs, we would need 113 surgeons. Now, looking back to that workforce data, if we assume that 63 of those mixed practice surgeons devoted half of their time to lung cancer surgery, which we're not sure that's true, we have a current total of 89 whole, whole time equivalents. So you can see we are understaffed in terms of specialist thoracic surgical expertise. So the bottom line, if we want to maximize lung cancer resection rates, England needs to recruit 25 to 30 new pure thoracic surgeons. And there are several ways we could do that. We could increase the, the number of surgeons in training who currently train in both cardiac and thoracic and increase the number who were specially trained in thoracic surgery and particular lung cancer surgery. <laughs> Perhaps we could persuade the surgeons who currently have a mixed practice to decide if they want to specialize in either cardiac or thoracic surgery. Failing that, if our authorities don't realize the importance and don't, train the, uh, don't change the training structure, or our hospitals don't realize the importance of our surgeons specializing, we could import new thoracic surgeons from within the EU. But that, of course, would not be particularly acceptable to many of the uh, population or medical uh, specialities. We hear a lot about the developments in new drugs and technology but I will put it to you that these have borderline effects on the overall survivorship in lung cancer. There is unpublished data as yet uh, to be released that shows that increasing the resection rate has a, has a major impact on the population survival from lung cancer. And there is data to suggest that if everyone, all the centers move to the higher resection rate, they could increase survival in lung cancer in England by 12%, which could approximate to over 5,000 extra survivors from lung cancer over a three-year period. So surgery is still important, vitally important, in the treatment of lung cancer, and the message is specialist lung cancer surgery is even more important. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Waller. I think the message was very clear, and the future for thoracic surgery seems bright in the UK. Mm -hmm. Any questions or comments? Yeah, uh, Stephen Pinn, Doctors Net UK. Um, the recommend, uh, recommendations that you've outlined are very laudable, but given the financial constraints facing the National Health Service in the UK, are they feasible? Would not a cost-benefit analysis of some description uh, help to make the case? In other words, the cost of training and employing more specialists thoracic surgeons against the benefits 
of an increase in lung resection rates. So are you asking me how much money they ch should sp the government should spend to increase the survival of patients from lung cancer? I mean, that's not my decision. Clearly, it has to be costed. What is true is that we are training cardiothoracic surgeons, and I'm a member of, I'm a training program director. But as yet, there is not a clear direction to us whether we should train specialist lung cancer surgeons or mixed practice cardiothoracic surgeons. The money is already in the system to train those doctors. What needs to be refined is the direction of their training. The question of whether hospitals should or could afford to employ more lung cancer surgeons is a decision obviously I can't take, but what price 5,000 extra survivors? Uh, David, in that respect, is it true that cardiac surgery is a bit on the decline in the UK and that probably some cardiothoracic surgeons will shift to thoracic surgery? It is true that the number of coronary bypass operations being performed has reduced as a result of the interventional cardiology. So yes, it is possible that cardiac surgeons have more spare time on their hands, but these are cardiac surgeons who lasted lung cancer surgery many years ago and there's a possibility they may not have access to the latest thoracic surgical techniques. Okay. Yes. Um, do you have any sense of how uh, applicable these findings are to other countries in the UK um, about the um, shortfall in thoracic surgeons? Speaking to an American surgeon from uh, Salt Lake City last night at, at the gala dinner, he tells me that in the United States, around half of the lung cancer surgery is not performed by lung cancer specialists, so it's performed by general surgeons. So yes, this message is worldwide. With the advances in thoracic surgical techniques, you need specialist expertise and therefore specialist training. Yes, please. Um, Susan Mayer from the BMJ, do you think with the interest there is now in the potential perhaps for screening uh, and so that will probably increase people with small tumours perhaps for resection, what impact do you envisage that having on, on the situation? My understanding from screening programmes, as you say, it identifies more early stage lung cancer and they are the exact cases that could be operated upon. So yes, one of the possible consequences is a greater need for surgery. But I would point out to you that this National Lung Cancer Audit has already identified that about half of all the stage one lung cancers in the United Kingdom at the moment don't get surgery. So the future impact of screening is small beer compared to what is already out there. You've heard from Suresh's presentation that we are talking about an aging population and the demographics of lung cancer is changing. And we, I, my, in my personal practice now, over my 15 year consultant practice, I've seen a shift away from larger central squamous carcinomas in men to more peripheral adenocarcinomas in elderly women. And if you ask me how we change the resection rate, I think it is in this group of patients, the borderline patients, the elderly female with the ad peripheral adenocarcinomas. This is where, we, in our, my personal practice, I found the increase in surgical resection rates. It's being able to employ new surgical techniques such as keyhole surgery to this population that has enabled us to operate on these patients. Yes, please. Um, I actually have a question for you, Dr. Waller, that addresses uh, the prior paper on the SABER. So speaking from a surgeon's perspective, in elderly patients who have the option of undergoing radiotherapy or surgery, how do you see those two techniques uh, comparing? Well, the important thing is that these patients get some treatment. I don't think we need to have a competition between surgeons and radiotherapists. We need to, uh, from a perspective, uh, point of view, analyze what patients can be operated upon and give the patient the choice. In my personal practice, in these high-risk patients, they always see myself and then I refer them on to see the radiotherapist in my units. Uh, the patient makes an informed decision based on the results. And the important thing is they get to make a decision and they're not told, you're too old, there's no point in having any treatment. But I don't see it as a competition. 
the important thing is we work in these multidisciplinary teams and give the patients the data and the information for them to make an informed decision. Perhaps, perhaps I could add one, one comment. Uh, there is a North American trial open for patients with borderline high risk, high risk group for, uh, for surgery. And we have applied to join that because we still believe that there's room for trials and not dogma and to give patients the choice. So some European centers, including myself, have applied to join. And in that um, study, patients who are borderline operable, in other words, those at high risk for complications, will be randomized to either surgery or to saber. And the end point is survival. OK, and then the final question. Um, maybe if you could also both address this. So what do you see as the primary pros and cons of the two different procedures, the, the kinds of things that you would talk about with patients? It's difficult to know from the results we have already. Um, obviously, we have to give the patient a general anesthetic, despite the use of keyhole surgery techniques which improve the recovery from the operation, the elderly patient has to undergo a general anaesthetic. On the positive side, we can be sure we've got an accurate tissue diagnosis by removing the tumour and an accurate stage by intraoperative staging. And there is evidence in particular patient with emphysema that removing that emphysematous lung can be beneficial to their lung function and quality of life, the so-called lung volume reduction surgery effect, which you will get to a certain extent with irradiating the lung, but by removing the damaged lung where the cancer is, the patient's lung function may actually improve, uh, and we operate for that as a primary reason for operating anyway. So that would be the potential benefits of surgery. The risk, of course, is the risk of giving a general anaesthetic, and these patients have cardiovascular morbidity, and that that group of patients are probably the ones that, that will uh, benefit most from a non-anaesthetic radiotherapy ablative technique.